Alfred Korzybski introduced general semantics in 1933 with the publication of Science and Sanity, which was subtitled An Introduction to Non-Aristotelian Systems and General Semantics. He referred to systems in the plural because general semantics is one of many possible non-Aristotelian systems. And it's important to note that Korzybski was not opposing everything that Aristotle stood for, but rather that he was specifically concerned with Aristotle's logic, with the mode of thought that it represented, and especially with the way that others had used it over the centuries. And Korzybski explained that Aristotelian logic is perfectly valid when applied as a special case. But for most of human affairs, what we need is a non-Aristotelian mode of thought, just as scientists have adopted non-Newtonian physics and mathematicians have embraced non-Euclidean geometries. The term non-Aristotelian has sometimes been abbreviated as non-A or null-A or symbolized by the letter A with a line or bar over it. Of course, non-A or null-A is another way of saying not-A, and to move for a moment from A to B, not is a term that is used as an operator in Boolean logic, which is a post-Aristotelian logic George Boole introduced in the 19th century, which was employed by Claude Shannon as he developed information theory in the 20th century. Not is also a term that is used by S.I. Hayakawa in his famous definition of general semantics that it's the study of how not to make a damn fool of yourself. Reconciling Hayakawa with Korzybski, we might well define general semantics as how not to make an ass out of you and me. But I digress. According to Boolean logic, not A would encompass everything in the universe that is not Aristotle's logic, which would include, in addition to general semantics, the semiotics of Charles Saunders Peirce, the new criticism of I.A. Richards, Alfred North Whitehead and Burton Russell's theory of logical types, Ludwig Wittgenstein's concept of language games, Suzanne Langer's philosophy of symbolic form, Norbert Wiener's cybernetics, Gregory Bateson's systems theory, and media ecology as formally introduced by Neil Postman. But the world of not A would also include socks, penguins, quarks, cell phones, New Zealand, and everything from milkshakes to the Milky Way including the proverbial kitchen sink. In other words, the set of everything but Aristotle's logic is much too broad a category to be of much use to us. And you might say that Korzybski was begging the question of, what then? That is, if not A, then what? And by the way, if-then statements are common features of computer programming languages which are based on Boolean logic. At this point, I'd like to turn to another seminal thinker from the field of media ecology for one possible answer to this question, and that scholar is Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan would explain that Aristotle and the system of logic that he codified were products of a culture that had been radically transformed by the introduction of the Greek alphabet. To provide a brief and cursory summary, the alphabet encouraged the separation of the knower from the known, allowing the products of the mind to be viewed and reviewed, providing the critical distance that brings with it a measure of objectivity and objectification. Writing takes discourse out of its concrete situation in space and time and its specific relationships between living, breathing human beings. And this decontextualization opens the door to high-level abstractions and abstract thinking. This also allows for an emphasis on analysis and the alphabet, provides the model whereby utterances may be broken down to the basic units 
we call letters. That model led to the notion that all matter may be broken down into atoms, which was introduced by the pre-Socratic philosophers known as Ionian physicists. And the alphabet brings with it a perspective that is linear and sequential, the basis of a logic that says, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. In other words, Aristotelian logic. So, if A is for alphabet, what then is not A? Looking backwards, we might point to orality, as in Walter Ong's key work, Orality and Literacy. But what Korzybski called non-Aristotelian would today be better understood as post-Aristotelian. And since orality is associated with a mode of thought that would be pre-Aristotelian, the answer we're looking for is not the big O. Instead, we can understand that after tens of thousands of years of orality, followed by a few thousand years of literacy, we now occupy a new era of human history based on the technological innovation of electricity. Indeed, McLuhan argued that the period of over two millennia of the alphabetic culture that defined the West has come to an end, replaced by the age of the electric circuit, electrical technology, and the electronic media. And given our penchant for alphabetic abbreviation, it is altogether fitting that for some time now we have been using the letter E to stand for electronic, for the products of computer technology such as email, e-commerce, e-business, e-banking, and the e-books that have caused so much agita in the publishing industry. We might well add to this list a term such as e-world to represent our electronic media environment. And so, McLuhan gives us the answer to the question Korzybski posed, the answer being, if not A, then E. So, if Aristotle is the face of alphabetic thought, who would best represent electric consciousness? If we wanted to stay with the ancient Greeks, the answer might well be one of those Ionian physicists, Heraclitus. Heraclitus emphasized the concept of change and the dynamic nature of reality, summed up by his famous observation that you can never step into the same river twice. And while he was an atomist, he argued that it was fire that was the basic element of all things. And fire, unlike water, air, and earth, is not a form of matter but rather a dynamic process of transformation. Moreover, electricity at this time was thought to be a form of fire, later referred to as St. Elmo's fire. In addition to his natural philosophy, Heraclitus emphasized the importance of logos, a Greek word that refers to language, logic, and reason alike. And speaking of Greek, while the name Heraclitus begins with an H, the letter H in our Roman alphabet comes from the Greek letter that looks like our H, but actually is a vowel called eta, so that his name in Greek would be better translated as Heraclitos, an appropriate name for our E world. But even with this revised spelling, Heraclitus is too far removed from the electric age to serve as an appropriate symbol for us. And when it comes to the modern discovery of electricity and electric technologies, quite a few candidates come to mind, such as Benjamin Franklin, who caught lightning in a bottle, Luigi Galvani, who experimented on electrical stimulation of the body, Mary Shelley, who imagined the possibilities of electricity as a life force, Andre Marie Ampere, who discovered electromagnetism, Michael Faraday, who invented the electric generator, Samuel Morse, who invented the magnetic Magnetic Telegraph, James Clerk Maxwell, who established the existence of electromagnetic fields, Heinrich Hertz, who discovered radio waves, Guglielmo Marconi, inventor of the wireless, J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron, and Nikola Tesla, whose many inventions include alternating current. 
But perhaps the individual who most powerfully symbolizes electricity in the public mind and whose last name happens to begin appropriately enough with an E is the Wizard of Menlo Park, Thomas Alva Edison. Edison's connection also harkens back to orality as the inventor of the phonograph, but he is best remembered for the electric light and also known for his kinetoscope, which made motion picture projection feasible. But as much as he was identified with light, Edison had a dark side and was severely lacking in ethics. So he's not the best choice to represent our new e-world. At this point, I would turn back to Korzybski and consider the individual who inspired him to develop his non-Aristotelian system, the scientist most closely associated with non-Newtonian physics and non-Euclidean geometry, Albert Einstein. Although Einstein was not associated with electricity per se, McLuhan did identify him with the new way of thinking characteristic of the electric age, one in which the old linear and mechanistic view of space and time was superseded by a new emphasis on discontinuities and relativities. Einstein, of course, was famous for, among other things, an equation, specifically E equals mc squared, which stands for energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. And what this equation drives home is a notion that was building over the course of the 19th century, the idea that energy is the basic stuff of the universe, that everything in the universe is a form of energy. Much of this understanding begins with the study of heat, giving rise to the laws of thermodynamics, and that brings us back to the fires of Heraclitus. But heat, electricity, electromagnetism, light, sound, and the atomic, all are forms of energy. So we can replace electricity with energy as the more inclusive term for our e-world. Energy was very much at the heart of Korzybski's thinking as he was an engineer and as an engineer was concerned with work, which requires power, which requires energy. Korzybski began his development of a non-Aristotelian system by introducing his taxonomy of classes of life. Chemistry binding plant life being based on chemical energy space binding animal life being based on kinetic energy and time binding human life being based on a special kind of potential energy what we might call temporal energy that is the ability to store and preserve knowledge to build on past discoveries and make progress the first law of thermodynamics expresses what is known as the conservation of energy, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The second law of thermodynamics states that the energy in a closed system will tend to lose its quality over time, moving towards a state of increasingly greater disorder, randomness, and chaos, or entropy. Things fall apart. Noise invariably interferes with communication. Signals degrade. There's always something lost in transmission or translation. And no matter how much time we spend cleaning house, after a while it only gets messy again. And as Aristotle himself would put it, all men are mortal. We are born and gestate through a process of differentiation and that miraculous feat of organization breaks down and disintegrates when life comes to an end. But entropy is not all bad as absolute order would represent a frozen stasis that would be just as dead as absolute chaos. The phrase, on the edge of chaos has come into use to explain the ways in which systems move from states of lesser to greater complexity, going against the grain of the second law of thermodynamics. The injection of just a little bit of entropy in the form of random mutation, for example, or in the role of the genetic dice known as sexual reproduction, that makes possible the process of evolution as the second direction that energy can lead us to. Evolution and entropy are not absolute opposites, but opposing tendencies of growth and dissolution, complexity and chaos. Between the two, 
we might look for a measure of balance, of homeostasis, that is, a dynamic state in which change within the system allows the system to maintain itself in a seemingly unchanging fashion. In short, between entropy and evolution lies equilibrium. So having established that energy is the starting point for our e-world, we can add that it moves in these three directions, entropy, evolution, and equilibrium. The three directions of energy all involve the dimension of time, and Einstein's move from matter to energy also involves a shift from a physics that viewed the universe in absolute terms of a timeless space to a relativistic physics in which all phenomena are events in space-time. For this reason, I would place events at the center of E-world. The dimension of time is missing from Euclidean geometry and Newtonian physics and from Aristotelian logic as well. Factoring time into the equation was a process that occurred in many different ways, from the calculus of Leibniz and Newton to the cubism of Picasso. It includes the historical consciousness that began to emerge in the 18th century and Darwin's theory of natural selection introduced in the 19th century. It includes a renewed emphasis on sound, acoustic space, and secondary orality that, as discussed by McLuhan and Ong, is associated with the introduction of electricity, electrical technologies, and the electronic media. It includes Korzybski's general semantics and the linguistic relativism of Edward Sapir, Dorothy Lee, and Benjamin Lee Whorf, notably Whorf's argument that Hopi and Navajo languages, with their emphasis on verbs as opposed to nouns, represents a metaphysics consonant with Einstein's non-Newtonian physics. Inspired by this, Buckminster Fuller described himself by saying, I seem to be a verb. And the scholar of Kabbalah, David A. Cooper, elaborated on the idea that God is a verb. Media ecology, being time-oriented, has been associated with the study of effects, especially the effects that innovations have on societies and individuals, and more generally with the effects resulting from changes made to systems. And systems theory has been associated with the concept of emergence, which refers to the new phenomena that emerge out of systems as a consequence of the relationship of their parts. Systems themselves sometimes emerge out of the interaction of their parts, organizing themselves spontaneously. Emergence and effects are both types of events resulting from the tendency of energy to move in the direction of entropy or evolution or equilibrium. At this point, I think it necessary to incorporate human subjectivity into my e-world model as we move down from events to again split into three directions. The first is experience which represents the individual's relationship to reality. The relationship between events and experience corresponds broadly to Korzybski's model of the process of abstracting, which he referred to as the structural differential. At the top of that model is the event level, while experience would encompass all the rest. Experience is a subjective phenomena, but subjectively, we tend to perceive our environment as made up of objects. And this opens the door for the concept of objectivity and for objectification. We are in the habit of relating to phenomena as things, and general semantics represents an attempt to put us closer in touch with the world of events in space-time. Experience here corresponds to what Martin Buber refers to as I-it relationships, which he contrasts with I-you relations, that is, our relationships with other human beings insofar as we regard them as fellow persons and not things. I have represented that element by the term empathy, 
because that is what language and symbolic communication unlock in us. That's the ability to feel for others, imagine what it's like to experience the world as others, and to see ourselves as others see us. To understand empathy, we have to draw upon the symbolic interactionist perspective of George Herbert Mead and Irving Goffman, the humanist psychology of Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, and the relational approach of Gregory Bateson, Paul Watzlawick, and Deborah Tannen. As we move from the monologic of experience to the dialogic of empathy, the next step over is to ecologic, that is, ecology. I use ecology here to represent the complexities of interactions among many different people that make up our social lives. Here, ecology represents our social networks, both face-to-face -face and technologically mediated, including family and friends, neighbors and communities, professional affiliations and amateur associations, and societies and cultures. And to understand ecology, we need to turn to the work of scholars such as Lewis Mumford, Harold Innes, Eric Havelock, Jacques Ellul, Elizabeth Einstein, and Denise Schmant Besserat, and of course, McLuhan, Ong, and Postman. Experience, empathy, and ecology are not isolated elements, but rather are very much interactive with each other so that, for example, our relationships influence the way that we experience the world. And the three aspects of human subjectivity converge once again, together constituting our environment. Korzybski described his perspective as that of, I quote, the organism as a whole in an environment. And the inclusion of environment here also serves as a reminder to maintain a holistic perspective. Not to mention the fact that McLuhan emphasized that we're actively engaged with our environments, influencing and altering them, creating entirely new human environments, and being shaped and molded in turn by those environments that we've created. Environment, then, is properly located at the base of this e-world model. The nine elements identified so far have been arranged in a hierarchical fashion, but I want to emphasize that they're all connected to one another, all interconnected. And underlying all of these elements as the foundation of the model is the simple fact of existence. Or to draw on general semantics once more, we might just call it etc., by which we mean and everything else. But I use existence here to signify the fact that this model is informed by existentialism and is very much concerned with the basic question of human existence. Existence, then, needs to be located at the foundation of e-world. And for those of you of a spiritual bent, we can crown the model on top with Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for God. This covers the monotheistic religions, and for any pagans, neo-paganists, animists, and the like, although Elohim is translated as God grammatically, it is a plural noun and therefore covers polytheism as well. Some students of Kabbalah embrace a less than personal concept of the divine or supernatural, an understanding of Elohim as the Ein Sof the infinite, which is consonant with forms of Eastern mysticism. Elohim can also serve as a metaphor for the transcendental quality of nature, as it did for Baruch Spinoza, a founder of the Enlightenment. And it can simply stand in for our sense of awe at the wonders of the universe, for the mysteries of life and death that we may never solve. In the words of Albert Einstein, I quote, The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. Taken as a whole, this model for e-world resembles the tree of life diagram of the Kabbalah. 
I didn't set out to construct a model on that basis, but as I was working on it, it quite naturally fell into that archetype. So perhaps in place of the Kabbalistic tree of life, what we have here is the E of life. One difference between the two is that the tree of life has ten elements, known as the sephirot, which represent ten aspects of the divine, the ten media, if you will, of the Ein Sof, the infinite. But this E of life doesn't stop at ten elements, it goes up to eleven. And maybe that's only fitting, but there is a way to solve the incongruity. Again, using the Kabbalah as inspiration, we can consider existence and Elohim as two aspects of the same element, not two separate elements. And in doing so, connect the top of the model to the bottom of the model in circular fashion. This is only fitting for E-World, given that electricity requires a circuit, and Einstein's non-Newtonian physics established that space is curved. Heck, even Aristotle knew that the world is round. The original tree of life of legend was said to exist in the Garden of Eden. As you may recall, there was a bit of a snafu back in Eden concerning Eve and involving Adam and an apple. Which brings us back to the beginning, not just to Genesis, but back to A. The apple came from the tree of knowledge, not the tree of life, and the A of the alphabet and the A of Aristotle's logic represent innovations of the greatest importance in our ability to obtain and maintain knowledge. Having eaten of the apple and gained that knowledge, it is now time for us to move on to the next stage, which is not a return to the past, not a step back to Eden as a golden age, nor a step up to Eden as the afterlife. Rather, it is time for the creation of a new Eden, right here, right now, on eWorld.